Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you, everyone, for regrouping here. Uh, we're going to have another two sessions of talks here, and our next speaker will be Parta Sabeti. She's of Harvard Systems Biology Center and also the Broad Institute. Uh, she'll be talking today about evolutionary forces in humans and microbes. So thank you very much, Pardis. Um, thank you very much. I'm really excited about the opportunity to speak here today at Microsoft Research. We're in a really, uh, in particular, in such an exciting time in computational biology where we have an opportunity to make so many discoveries. And in particular, my interest is in the discovery of the evolution of humans and the pathogens, the different microbes that infect humans. Um, so I'm just going to give you an overview of uh, my talk, which is essentially an overview of my lab. It's the areas that we're interested in, which is human evolution, uh, pathogens, and then uh, method and tool development um, around, around these different enterprises. So um, it has long been known that natural selection uh, shaped the human genome. Um, I think in basically in, in 1858, Darwin and Walsh published the principles of natural selection that really, you know, galvanized this effort. Um, but even before then, uh, individuals, many individuals have been thinking about evolution. But we have very few examples that have been elucidated. Some of the classic ones that you might know about are malaria um, resistance driven by mutations in the hemoglobin gene, um, one of which causes sickle cell mutation. Um, mutations in pigmentation pathway that have evolved since humans spread out of Africa into Europe and in Asia. Um, the ability to drink milk, lactose tolerance, as we domesticated cattle. These are some classic examples, and we know about them because of their sort of strong biological hypothesis for evolution, but also because they leave distinctive signals behind in our genomes. And the interesting thing is that as we now begin to explore, there are many such signals in the genome, um, yet we don't know what many of them do. And the, the, the wonderful thing is now when we have sequencing data from lots of genomes, we can mine these sequence data. And what we see is that actually when evolution does occur, it leaves behind a footprint in the genome. As a mutation emerges and spreads through the population, there's a pattern that can be detected. And it's actually quite a large pattern, a large signal, a large footprint in the genome. And the question is, what is also the mutation that's driving it? And that's sort of what my lab has very much been interested in. And uh, we can do this type of research just by looking at 100 individuals, even sometimes less than that, but 100 individuals is usually sufficient to find many of the most distinctive signals of evolution in the genome. Just 100 people um, in a population today. And we you know, collect their DNA and begin to look for these patterns. And they look a little bit like this. So this is what I call the genomic signal of natural selection. If you look here, essentially, I'll just move over. Um, you look here is basically a cartoon showing a set of individuals, and at some point they have a mutation that uh, emerges in one individual, uh, one person's germline. And that mutation, if it's more likely to enhance the survival or the reproductive success of individuals who carry it, it'll you know, be more likely to, that person will more likely survive, reproduce, pass it on to their children. Their children will survive, reproduce, pass it on to their children's children. And that mutation will spread very quickly, right? So that's the classic signal of natural selection that we are used to. But on a genomic level, we can see those patterns. Because if the mutation has occurred recently in time, you take those individuals in population, you have before selection and after selection. There's two things that are generally driving variation in the genome. Uh, there, there are different patterns, but two classic ones that we know about or you hear about in your biology textbook. One's mutation, and the other one is recombination. So mutation generates new variants in the population. This is just a cartoon of five positions along a chromosome. Um, and mutation will create these sort of new variants in the population. And recombination will reshuffle the pattern on which those variants exist on a chromosome. And so over time, that recombination and mutation whittles away the background on which a mutation arises. And you get this sort of mosaic pattern, right? But when a mutation emerges and spreads very quickly through the population, it'll do so in such rapid time that recombination will not have time to whittle away that, those relationships. And so we can see different distinctive patterns in the genome. Um, one of them is what we call long-range correlations. 
It's basically a segment of the genome in which all of the variants are correlated to each other. Another one is population differences, is when uh, evolution occurs in one population subject to some pressure, but not in other populations, it'll drive these large differences between populations. And there's a number of other signals like those that we use to detect the signal of selection in the genome. Um, and now with data from uh, sort of the era of genomics, we, we're getting more and more resources in order to explore that. Um, we have complete genomes of humans, chimpanzees, mouse, gr uh, gorilla, all sorts of organisms. We then moved to large databases of genetic variation. Then we started getting large data sets of genotype variation, and now full sequence data. It allows us for the first time to really do these genome-wide scans of natural selection. But one of the issues that have arised when we do this kind of work is, as I said, that so that mutation emerges and it spreads through the population, takes a whole chunk of the genome with it, right? The whole, like, chunk of a chromosome. And so within that, it becomes very difficult to figure out who is the actor, right? Where that large footprint, you're trying to find the single mutation. And uh, one of the things is here are the different kinds of tests that people have used to identify signals of selection. And you can see over a very large region, this is about a megabase long, there are mutations all along it that are spiking over what you'd expect that are telling you that there's a signal of selection somewhere over here, but it's sort of very diffuse. And so what we decided to do is we developed a composite framework, a composite likelihood framework, to combine um, all of these tests together to say what is the probability that each mutation ac across a region of the genome is the causal mutation given its score by any one of these tests. And as we do that, essentially, it cleans up the signal very strongly. So this is sort of the power of using multiple lines of largely independent evidence. Um, and here you can see that essentially um, a lot of this noise got cleared up because any one of these mutations may have a high score by one test, but it's very unlikely that they'd have a high score by all the tests if they weren't the driver. Um, and here you can see this peak right across here. And this is a phenylalanine to leucine change in a gene that's critical for pigmentation. So even though we had detected a signal surrounding pigmentation, you can see it's a very large region. region. As we use the combined framework, it, can, it localized to the gene and to an amino acid change within the gene. And once we had sort of done that on a number of examples that we were sort of felt pretty comfortable with, we, you know, our positive controls, things we expected to be under evolutionary pressure, we applied it to lots of regions in the genome. And we could see a lot of those signals clearing up. And it gave us the first opportunity to really explore um, what are the mutations that are driving human evolution? Um, and here's just, a, I'm going to give you like a couple uh, quick examples of the type of work that we've done since that time. So here's another region. It was 800 kilobases, 800,000 bases long, of a region that had selection. You can see this large sort of diffuse signal. But when we applied the test, it really, it, it localized to just a few mutations that were high scoring in this region. Um, and right at the top here is a valine to alanine change in a gene called EDAR. And interestingly, EDAR had been known before, so um, there are many genes across this, but it really localized there. And um, this gene had actually become sort of important in evolution before we, we found this in stickleback fish, where it actually drives the development of scale. And so as stickleback fish were moving from freshwater, uh, sorry, fr from seawater into freshwater, they were losing their scale by mutations in this pathway. And in humans, this pathway regulates many things, um, uh, things on the ectoderm, but in particular hair and sweat, um, but also a number of other things. And so in a study that we did, led by uh, two members of my group, um, uh, Yana Kambroff and Xi Zhe Wang, um, they, we, what we did is we first explored the origins of that mutation um, and showed that it uh, emerged sometime in central China about 30,000 years ago and then spread throughout central China and out into the Asian populations and Native American populations. Uh, we placed the mutation into a mouse, the single point mutation we placed into a mouse. And what we showed is actually that the mice who got that single mutation actually got thicker hair on their body, got smaller mammary glands, and, and increased the number of eccrine glands on their paws. And that is actually, the, those, the hair and the sweat have been recapitulated in human populations as well. So the association is there in humans. Um, and also we've now been able to show in a model system that that single mutation can make those kinds of changes. Also, so um, we've essentially created a platform by which we can explore this kind of work. 
And so starting with the genome scan and then trying to fine map those variants using these types of composite frameworks, we then move to computational annotations, try to figure out all of the different mutations in that region and see what they're doing and what might be uh, important in them. And once we do, we move to these functional experiments. We first try some high throughput functional experiments because you want to really have good confidence in what you're looking at before you might move to model systems. Um, and then we can come to adaptive hypothesis. And in this uh, other paper done by four members of my group here, we, um, uh, and, and a lar the much larger team, we were able to show that a mutation in what we call a toll-like receptor, which is one of the important genes in innate immunity, and this particular one, TLR5, regulates uh, response to flagellated bacteria. So the flagellin in these bacteria drive um, a response that causes signal in cascade. That's very important. And we showed that a single amino acid change in the toll-like receptor also changes signaling to, um, in response to this uh, flagellin. And so these are the kinds of explorations we can have. I interestingly, um, this particular gene, we know that if you knock it out, mice don't respond to uh, basically an equivalent of typhoid fever. So that's one possible mechanism of evolution. But really, that's, we're still at the exploratory phase. Um, and that moves us to pathogens. Uh, uh, with a, I have a sort of come from a medical degree as well as a research background. I'm very interested in pathogens. That's sort of um, a lot of what my lab focuses on. And so I'm just going to tell you one story of, of many but one that we have explored, which is the top signal that we identified in one of our first scans of an African population, a population from Nigeria, the Yoruba. We found that the top signal by our first scan localized to a gene called large on chromosome 22. And so we began to explore what the gene does and what might be the driver, because essentially when we start these scans, we're generating new hypotheses. We don't know what could actually be the driver, so we're trying to explore and find it. And what we learned in our explorations is that this gene actually modifies alpha dystroglycam. So this is large, this yellow thing here, and here's alpha dystroglycam. Alpha dystroglycam is very important in muscle development, but it's also important on lots of different tissue types. And so when this modifies alpha dystroglycam, it puts these glycosyl groups on it, causes it to be cleaved, and sent up to the cell surface, where it does a number of activities. But one of the things that uh, is important for is it can be co-opted by microbes. Um, so alpha dystroglycan is basically an entry route for these microbes. Without this modification by large, the vi uh, these microbes can't get in. And one of the most important ones that's been uh, sort of implicated is a virus and a, and a set of viruses called arenaviruses, and one of the most important ones is Lassa virus. So essentially, I was beginning to explore this and saying, well, this is very interesting because Lassa was actually named after a city in Nigeria where it was first discovered. And we have a signal of selection in Nigeria uh, that's linked to this. And so we're trying to explore whether or not that might be the cause. And as a medical student, I never really heard about Lhasa. So it was sort of strange to me that this could possibly be one of the strongest drivers of human evolution, yet it's sort of little known. But as it turns out, it's much more important than I had uh, realized at first. So these, this is a little bit of, there's not that much known about it because there's small groups working on it, and it's a biosafety level four virus, meaning like Ebola, Marburg, smallpox. You can only work on it, uh, the live virus, in a, in a BL4 lab, right? And it's an extreme, uh, it, you know, has extreme fatality rates, extreme uh, potential for being aerosolized or going airborne, and is a bioterrorist threat. So it's very difficult to work in this area. But as it, as it turns out, it's estimated to, in fact, over 20,000 people a year. Uh, sorry, um, cause fatality of over 20,000 people a year, and in fact, many, many more. Um, it actually, like I said, not only was named after Nigeria, but if you look, a uh, village in Nigeria, but if you look actually across West Africa um, and look at seroprevalence studies, antibody response, there's uh, a great deal of exposure throughout West Africa, um, and in Nigeria. And antibody tests suggest that 21% of the population has been infected with this virus. Um, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, over 50% of some populations, some villages, have been infected. And it's not surprising that it's that widespread because this mouse here, this is Mastomys natalensis, is the sort of the house mouse that you see in many places in West Africa. It's developed, it's co-evolved to persistently breed Lhasa in its, in its blood. In certain populations that we've tested, over 50% of the rodents have carried this, uh, the virus in its blood. 
And at different times, it varies in population to population, but some populations have extreme exposure to this virus. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the fact that we call it a category A agent because sometimes fatality rates can be, we, we've seen the 80 percent, right, but above 50 percent often, but yet you're saying that doesn't quite work because most people actually get infected and don't even get sick at all. We suggest that this is not only the only category A agent, biosafety level four agent, that's a huge public health crisis, but also it might be a potential ancient selective force driving evolution. So this is pointing us in that direction. Um, and so uh, once we found the signal in 2007, we went to the Arua Specialist Teaching Hospital, set up a diagnostic lab, began collecting samples. Uh, we also partnered with Tulane University and Bob Gary here to uh, work with them on a, on a site that they've been developing um, in Sierra Leone at the Kenema Government Hospital uh, focused on diagnostics. And we uh, have great support from the NIH to sequence both the virus and then humans infected with the virus analyze them to see what are the host and viral uh, components that are important in susceptibility. I'm just going to show you a few um, images. I just want to warn you that these, the next image slide is going to have some disturbing images. So um, look away if you're not. I'll let you know when it comes back. Um, this is what we think about when we think of Lassa virus. So these are some of the patients that we see. These are ones we've seen in Sierra Leone. And you can see this is the classic sense of when you think about Ebola and these different kinds of hemorrhagic fevers, extreme, um, extreme bleeding from, from every mucosal bed. The next slide uh, is now, we're off that slide, is um, what many of our cases look like. So you have that classic example you have in your head of a hemorrhagic fever and what you're expecting to find. But what we found is that a lot of our patients actually look a lot like this, where um, you know, they just look sleepy, a little ill, malaise, but nothing extreme. But these ones actually have similar fatality rates, right? So it's not um, that many of these individuals die, but they do not look uh, what you would think is the classic example. So it, the more we began to visit those regions and stay in those regions, the more we thought, are we talking, are we just not detecting things that are as lethal, um, but just don't look what we are uh, like what we're expecting to see. And so, uh, you know, as I showed you before, the seroprevalence suggests that this actually is a widespread virus, right? Um, it is, uh, it's across all of this West Africa, and you're seeing uh, high seroprevalence in many populations. We also see that animal habitat is quite wide as well, um, and this natalensis has co-evolved. And finally, as we sequenced the virus ourselves just most recently, we sequenced over 100 strains from Nigeria and Sierra Leone, from humans and rodents. We identified, we looked at the, the data, and it looks like the virus is actually over a millennia old. So it's at least about 1,200 years old, circulating in Nigeria, and seems to have spread out of Nigeria into the rest of West Africa uh, within the last few hundred years, and actually entered Sierra Leone likely around 150 years ago. That's by our estimates. And so we're talking about a virus that is not emerging, right? It's actually circulating widely and has been so for a long, long time. And we see the same kinds of patterns when we analyze data from Ebola and elsewhere. And so it, it led us to think, are we dealing with emerging disease or emerging diagnosis? And that's a big force of, of the work in my lab. Um, and it really affects the way we think about care, that essentially we learned so much because you know, we started in here um, analyzing uh, large sequences in the lab, but we had to set up diagnostics in order to do this work. But in doing so, we actually engaged the community because the hospitals were, the, were empowered, the community was engaged, we started to affect care, and as we collected samples, the communities began to respond. And we started to essentially get this large database of not just individuals with Lhasa, but with lots of other fevers that we don't know. And so we're really going out to explore what are the causes of fever that we're not detecting, that are circulating widely that we may not know about. And then the last thing in the last couple of minutes I just want to mention to you is that also our lab is focused on methods. So I told you about one method, the composite method that we use to detect selection. Um, I'll just show you a couple frames that show you the other kinds of methods we've developed. Uh, with one of my students, uh, Dave Rechef, and now his, and his brother Yakir, we had, he had entered my lab also interested, uh, you know, being an MD-PhD, was interested in um, figuring out how we could mine these large health databases and find patterns, uh, find new patterns. And so what we looked at is we, there was an issue. That there are lots of statistics that people use, but many of them only have certain um, strengths. Uh, and one issue that we found was that actually different, none of the methods were what we call general and equitable, in the sense that they're able to detect any kind of pattern in data, 
um, and for any noiseless function, give it a score of 1. So you give it a perfect score of finding every noiseless function in data. Um, and then as basically we add noise to the function to be able to drop off so that we can get some sort of a score that's meaningful, so that we can mine these large databases looking for the strongest relationships. And so this is just an example of um, mutual information by Kraskov. That's one of the state-of-the-art mutual information techniques. And one of the issues you find with it is you look at these 27 different functions we were exploring with different noise levels, that uh, the, this kind of test actually weights towards things that are more linear. So this sinusoidal relationship uh, that's noiseless will get the same score as a linear relationship that has lots of noise. Um, and you see those sort of issues all the way across. So if you're mining large databases looking for um, relationships that are not you know, always linear and not always monotonic, it's going to be a struggle. And so we went out and we looked, explored at lots of different types of state-of-the-art methods that have different strengths, like a Spearman is very good for linear things but then drops off for others, or other relationships that just kind of behave differently for different functions. We went out and we, we set out to develop a new statistic and this just shows you the properties of the original statistic we developed and we're continuing to work on it. But essentially, it is approaching more of what you're looking for, which is something that gives every noiseless function a score of 1, um, and then drops off in a linear fashion as you increase noise to the data. So now you can set out to explore it. So explore your data in a more sort of um, systematic way. And we, in a paper that we published a couple, uh, in two late 2011, we then showed how this uh, method could be powerful on data from wide ranging from the world health to baseball to yeast to microbiome to find new patterns in data. Um, and the, other, uh, the rest of my lab also develops lots of different tools um, and the suites of tools including visualization tools. So Dave and Andreas in my lab um, have done a great deal of work of developing a visualization system to rapidly explore your data sets. Um, put them in, in these, find the patterns in the data, and then, and then look at them visually. Um, the ben Fry and Patrick Varelli were uh, a major force to, um, behind developing SWEEP, which is a way of looking at natural selection in genomic data. Um, and Eric Fallon and my group developed something called EpiSampler, which allows us to do rapid collections in the field with barcodes, with GIS, of getting uh, sort of high quality data, um, clinical data and sample data um, for the projects that we do in global health. And with that, I just want to um, uh, say that a lot of this work is done for my lab. I just show holiday cards so that you can see the lab as it's evolved over the years. These are our annual holiday cards from 2009, 2010. Um, I have an incredibly creative group. Um, uh, every year, sort of surprising uh, folks with their new methods and last year Gangnam Style, and then this year, this is actually the first, uh, this is the first time you'll see our latest card, which is this SNL theme. Um, and so this is sort of the end of the night, and you can see, like, they go all the way, because we've reenacted almost every shot in the, uh, uh, in the show. Um, my human evolution collaborators, my collaborators from Nigeria, from Sierra Leone, I'm extraordinarily grateful to have such an amazing team and support from so many different institutions, including the Gates Foundation. Thank you. Questions if we get them. Get that? Okay, sure. Thanks a lot for a great talk. We do have some time for questions. Great. Yep. Thank you. The first part of your talk? Yeah, sure. Um, yep, yeah, absolutely. Yes, so um, the question was, can you say a little bit more about the composite score and how does it work? So um, the composite, it's a parametric test in the sense that what we do is we develop simulations um, of lots of different types of selection occurring. So they're very good simulations that one can do of human evolution of genomic data and the evolution of genomic data. And so we have these different tests, many of which are just sort of, um, uh, sort of non-parametric tests that individuals have developed. But you essentially, what you do is you, uh, for each of those tests, the composite tests, there's five that go into it, you say, uh, you create distributions of what the mutation is that you care about and all of the other mutations nearby. Those, so for every, every time you have one mutation that's the driver, there's about 10,000 mutations next to it. You're trying to figure out which, how it's different from the rest. And so essentially you go um, variant by variant and say, what's the probability that it is the causal variant based on its score by this test, right? So you're comparing it to those simulations. And then you basically sum the likelihoods across all of the different tests 
and give a final composite likelihood score. Uh, so yeah, um, well that uh, yeah, all this thing. So it all depends on basically issues that, um, suggesting that it depends on the, the simulations. That's a larger discussion. I can talk with you offline because it's uh, it's one of those things where I show you the pretty cartoon and say this is natural selection shifting. But uh, then like ninety nine percent of our work is spent with every caveat as to why there are other things that could influence what you're seeing. So uh, but there's a lot of work that's been done on those simulations too. Yep. So, so I'm curious about what kinds of tests it is that you're using. Could you give one example so I can understand what those individual tests, sure. tests are? Sure. Yep. Um, so it was the ones I had mentioned at the beginning, but uh, briefly, which is like just one is population differences. So if you have an example of uh, the mutation that causes resistance to malaria, there's some population that has malaria and other population doesn't. So that mutation is only going to spread in the one population. And what it's going to do is drive major differences between populations. So a classic example is a mutation that protects from plasmodium vivax malaria, where it has achieved 100% prevalence in uh, Africa and is absent elsewhere in the world. And so natural selection will drive these major differences. So one big thing is you just go position by position across the genome and look for places where there's been a huge divide between and the other one I mentioned was those long-range correlations, when that mutation emerges and is, rises in prevalence, taking a whole chunk of the genome. That's another composite test. So it's essentially looking for those different, uh, there's statistics that identify those different patterns. Yeah. Any last question? Or we good? OK. OK, let's say thank you Great. one more time, Pardis. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you.